this week on Brian Ross Investigates. The elegant Tennessee walking horses with their high-stepping gait called the Big Lick, drawing big crowds and millions of dollars in prizes and stud fees, a proud tradition. But behind the scenes, the ongoing ugly secret of how those horses are scarred and soared, their legs soaked in acid and diesel fuel. So by uh, inflicting this pain on the horses, they get the horses to step higher and they're rewarded at the shows. Correct. This trainer, caught on tape beating the horses, pleaded guilty to state and federal criminal charges and was supposedly banned for life from being part of the sport. But now he's showing up at major competitions. And for him to be sitting there is egregious. We have a saying, big lick, big lie. Plus, lifestyles of the rich and infamous, a major investigative reporting coup documenting how the world's richest people hide their billions, buy their yachts, and take care of their mistresses. We're talking about some of the most famous people in the world that are in these documents. Presidents, prime ministers, government ministers. The Pandora Papers, pulling back the curtain. And this week's winners and losers in the media. See if you agree with the choices made by the editors of Media Item. From the Law and Crime Trial Network, this is Brian Ross Investigates. And good evening, and thank you for joining us, and welcome to our friends on Facebook Live. I'm Brian Ross, joined as always by my colleague here at Law and Crime, Rhonda Schwartz. And Rhonda, we begin with a disturbing story about the lengths to which some people will go to win. In this case, the trainers of those famed Tennessee walking horses. They've been caught in the past beating the horses, inflicting pain, really torturing them. Despite calls for reform, it turns out the practice never really stopped, Rhonda. That's right, Brian. The Humane Society of the United States first documented the practice, but now we're learning that a ban on those caught in the act and promises of reform seem to be empty words. But a warning to our viewers, some of the footage you are about to see may be disturbing. They are known as Tennessee walking horses, famed for their high-stepping gait called the Big Lick, with billions of dollars in prizes and stud fees for the very best of them. But behind the scenes, there has been an ugly secret. An undercover video investigation by the Humane Society of the United States 10 years ago documented disturbing scenes of torture. The horse's hooves scarred, soaked with acid or diesel fuel, and wrapped with heavy chains, all as a way to create pain and an even higher stepping horse. So by uh, inflicting this pain on the horses, they get the horses to step higher and they're rewarded at the shows. Correct. Dr. Bart Sutherland, a former USDA inspector, says the practice continues to this day. We've been into barns where they've used these chains that they put around the horse's leg like a bracelet, but they're, they're, they may weigh several pounds. And uh, just the trauma of that chain hitting on the back of the of the leg and stuff uh, will make them pick up their feet a lot higher. I, I've seen people apply all kind of petroleum products. Uh, sometimes they'll they'll uh, blistering blistering or, or burning them or using some type of chemical or acid to to irritate the back of that. The undercover video 10 years ago focused on one of the sport's most prominent trainers, Jackie McConnell. He was seen, along with two stable hands, beating the horses. He didn't want to talk about it when I approached him then on behalf of ABC News Nightline. Do you have any regrets about what you did to those horses? no comment. He showed no signs of remorse when we tracked him down outside his home this week. Don't you want to say something about that? Don't you want to apologize? Don't you want to apologize? I don't have any comment. McConnell later pleaded guilty to more than a dozen state and federal counts of animal cruelty, sentenced to a year of house arrest, and was supposedly banned from the sport for life. So Mr. Con McConnell has been an abuser of horses for decades. He's now a convicted felon. We're very happy that we have a felony conviction, but he's shown no remorse for the damage that he did to these animals. Countless victims of the torture that he inflicted upon them. But now animal welfare advocates say McConnell is back in good standing with the Tennessee walking horse industry. 
He was pictured last month at the sport's biggest gathering, the Celebration, even though the board of the Celebration had banned him for life following his convictions. The picture was taken by Mississippi lawyer and animal welfare advocate Clant C. I figured we had to document for the, this for the world. Uh, Jackie is part of the warp and weave of the big lick animal cruelty culture. And for him to be sitting there is egregious. It was Jackie and no one said one word about it. And then come to find out he's presenting, a, donating a trophy at the challenge trophy in his dad's name. Memorial challenge trophy donated by the Jimmy McConnell family of Shelbyville. The Jackie McConnell family of Collierville will be presented by Stacy and Alex Blackwell. And they said, well, we let him in on a technicality. He's just a spectator. Sir, he wasn't just a spectator. He was a participant in the warp and weave. The announcer called out his name. He was recognized. So what does that say about the commitment of the industry, of the community, to ban uh, this cruelty? We have a saying, big lick, big lie. Sir, they're disingenuous to the extreme. They're not truthful. C showed us one of his horses, Glimmer a one-time prize horse that he rescued from the so-called soaring. He was thrown away. He was on the, had a one-way ticket to a public auction to go to a slaughter truck in Mexico, and we rescued him. Former USDA inspector Dr. Sutherland says while there are plenty of horse owners who won't go along with it, the practice of soaring remains rampant. Very few of those cases get prosecuted. I mean, it's, you know, a small percentage of them wind up having any penalty at all. In fact, they would they would joke about it sometimes. You know, they didn't really seem to be bothered that we would write up a, a federal case. In fact, there were some some trainers that had 30, 40, you know, maybe more cases written against them and, and had yet to have a uh, <laughs> any penalty received from them. And so given that this practice then continues and they don't have much to fear. That's correct. It must have been very frustrating for you. It, it was frustrating to, to the point that I stopped doing it. <laughs> Clancy and a group of other animal welfare advocates are still trying to draw public attention to what is happening, showing up to protest at some of the big walking horse competitions. It is absolutely abhorrent that this scourge persists, it continues, that it operates under this cloak of secrecy by this cabal that is showing here tonight. There's a lot of money involved. They don't want to stop their games. You get out of here! This past weekend in North Carolina, there were people in the crowd who weren't very happy with Clancy trying to take pictures with his phone. I don't care if you want me here, big boy! Get out of here! Get out of here! I love my horses. I love my mares. I even love this dude behind me. I'm just devoted to it, Mr. Ross. I don't know what else to tell you. The Tennessee walking horse should be America's horse. And it just went astray. The Tennessee Walking Horse Celebration told us that uh, Jackie McConnell was allowed there because he was only a spectator, but that in the future his name will not be recognized in the programs or on the public address systems as the sponsor of one of his family's trophies. They say, by the way, that they are leading the fight against soaring and that the number of soaring incidents has sharply decreased. As for Jackie McConnell, I tried to reach him today on the phone. Can you give me an idea? I'm recording no, this, sir. I have no comment. No comment at all about why you were there? I thought you were banned for life. I have no comment. No comment from Jackie McConnell. Coming up next, a journalistic scoop. The lifestyles of the rich and the infamous exposed by an incredible journalism investigative report. You're watching Brian Ross Investigates on the Law and Crime Trial Network. Hi, this is Dan Abrams with exciting news for all of our Law & Crime followers on YouTube. You can now get the live Law & Crime Network with YouTube TV for all of your daily live trial coverage, legal news, expert analysis, and original true crime programs. Subscribe to YouTube TV today and then locate Law & Crime in the channel guide. And for only $1.99 a month, you can add the network to your bundle. Watch Law & Crime every day with YouTube TV. We put you in the jury box. We turn now to an amazing investigative journalism scoop. 
created by a group called the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. They got their hands on a treasure trove of documents, millions of documents, showing how shady financial firms helped to hide the wealth of the rich and the unscrupulous. This leak is really Panama Papers on steroids. This is the Pandora Papers, because we think we're opening a box on a lot of things. We're looking at about 12 million documents from 14 different service providers. These are law firms, um, firms that set up secret offshore accounts for people in multiple jurisdictions. The British Virgin Islands, Belize, Samoa. These documents, for the very first time, is actually showing the US as a tax haven itself. We're talking about some of the most famous people in the world that are in these documents. Presidents, prime ministers, government ministers. We're seeing them buying real estate. We're seeing them you know, trading in shares, using offshore companies. They're buying houses, cars, artworks. I guess it mostly demonstrates that the people that could end the secrecy of offshore, could end what's going on, are themselves benefiting from it, so there's no incentive for them to end it. And when the stories broke, it was big news around the world, and America's late-night comics had a good time with it. What? The rich and powerful have been hiding their wealth in offshore havens to avoid paying taxes? I am disgusted and extremely jealous, because I'm out here on TurboTax adding up line nine with line 37 like a bitch, when it turns out I could have just sent my salary to some island. Rich people, they're just not like us. <laughs> us pay taxes. Uh-oh, to the Caymans! And we're joined now by Michael Hudson, a senior editor at the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. Michael, thank you for being here. What a scoop. How long did it take to put it together? Uh, thanks for having me, Brian and, and, and Rhonda. Uh, uh, about two years. Um, uh, and it also took more than 600 journalists from 150 news outlets and 117 countries to kind of pull it off. I mean, some of our partners included the Washington Post, the BBC, the Indian Express, the Standard in Zimbabwe, and La Desk in Morocco, and, and many, many more, and, and a lot of just smart and courageous journalists around the world who are operating in uh, countries where sometimes uh, doing investigative journalism is considered a crime. And you learned a lot about presidents, prime ministers, kings, drug dealers, and a whole range of people who hide their money, the very, very wealthy. Essentially, how are they doing it, and why are they hiding their money? Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of different reasons. In, in some cases, people are hiding their money to avoid taxes. In some cases, uh, people are hiding their money because it's dirty money. It's money that came from... Uh, uh, you know, the profits from, from Ponzi schemes and other frauds or money that's been looted from a government program. Uh, you know, another thing, you know, the King of Jordan, uh, you know, we, we were able to document that he had bought 15 luxury homes in the U.S. and the U.K. over several years, uh, total price about $106 million. He also had 36 shell companies. Uh, his offshore uh, providers, his offshore advisors, you know, often re sometimes referred to him in emails simply as, you know who, in order to kind of keep him uh, sure. behind the scenes. But you know what? What the, the King of Jordan's uh, folks told us is, look, he doesn't. He doesn't have to pay. You know, by law, he doesn't pay taxes in uh, in Jordan. But but uh, other experts said, you know, but he also has a very good reasons not to flaunt his wealth. First of all, if he, you know, if if, if people knew that uh, he had this kind of wealth and these kind of houses, luxury houses around the world. It would obviously uh, uh, anger many of his citizens, but it might also concern many of the governments and uh, uh, aid organizations that have been, uh, you know, giving his country, which is one of the poorer countries in the Middle East, uh, lots of money over the years. So there, there, there's a whole range of reasons why why people do this and why people want to want the protection and, and in many cases the secret of the secrecy of an offshore company or an offshore trust. Michael, a question for you from Rhonda Schwartz. Rhonda? Michael, we know you can't reveal sources, but this is an extraordinary effort to crack one of the most secretive industries, offshore banking. What can you tell us about how the consortium was able to get their hands on all these documents? Uh, you know, I, I can't tell you much. I can just tell you that over the years, we worked <laughs> with lots of big leaks, including the Panama Papers. Uh, which had a very similar impact as, as this current project. 
And, you know, we sort of built a track record. ICAJ and its partners have built a track record of being able to handle these, these kind of giant leaks, protect our sources, and, and break, you know, big and important news and hit hard on these, these kind of issues. So th these leaks came to us. You know, one of the differences between um, the Pandora Papers and the Panama Papers is uh, quite simply the Pandora Papers, the, the, you know, the new leak, is larger and more global than the Panama Papers. The Panama Papers involved one law firm based in Panama, Mossack Fonseca. Uh, the Pandora Papers involve 14 offshore providers, law firms, and other kind of companies that set up offshore structures for people, uh, really just around the world, from from the Caribbean to the uh, uh, all the way to to the Persian Gulf, uh, to the South China Sea. Michael, I was struck by the fact that there weren't quite as many Americans as I thought there might be. Well, I think there there weren't as a as many American um, politicians, and those, of course, were many of the headline names. But there were definitely a, a significant number of Americans in, in, in the the data, uh, including Robert Durst, the you know the 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 uh, wealthy. Uh, right. <laughs> uh, entrepreneur made famous by his his various legal legal troubles, who was recently convicted of, of murder in one of the cases that has been sort of, you know, tracking him for for many years. And and the other thing uh, about the U.S. role is we found that um, the U.S. is not simply a passive participant in the offshore system. Uh, you know, most people in sort of popular imagination, you say offshore, and people think of like a palm fringed island. And, and, and definitely places like the Caymans and the British Virgin Islands are, are key cogs in the overall machine. But the truth is, is that many of the world's biggest banks, many of the world's biggest accounting firms, many of the world's biggest law firms, in one way or another, participate in the system, represent clients who who, who are, are, are using the system. And, and also the, the United States has its own sort of offshore entities that aren't offshore to the United States, but they're right there in, in, in the heartland. Um, you know, we we were able to uh, look at more than a dozen states uh, in the U.S. that that offer trusts that uh, foreign uh, investors, foreign politicians, and other folks, uh, if they want to hide their money or protect their money, they come to the U.S. And and you know one of the biggest biggest des destinations is South Dakota, which has turned itself into sort of a, a, a you know a Caymans on the Great Plains of America. Michael, one final question. It's often been speculated that perhaps Russian President uh, Putin is one of the wealthiest men, if not the wealthiest in the world. Who is the wealthiest man in the world based on what you're seeing? You know, I, I think our documents, I mean, it's it's definitely a big swathe of what's going on in the world in terms of, of, of money being moved around. But I don't think we have enough uh, to really say, like, who, who who's the richest? And and for us, it, we were, you know, of course, we want to write about the, the mega wealthy folks. But for us, what was most important really was looking at the politicians, the folks who could actually, you know, make a change and, and to some degree have the power to end the offshore system or, or drastically rein it in uh, what they're doing. So, we're, you know, in our, in our documents, we had uh, 35 current and former world leaders. That's presidents, uh, uh, prime ministers. Uh, and, and and of course the, the, the King of Jordan, and then also overall we had about three hundred, more than three hundred and thirty uh, high-level uh, public officials, including uh, government ministers, ambassadors, and then the, these heads of state also. All right. Well, Michael Hudson, congratulations on the investigative work. Uh, Michael Hudson, a senior editor at the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. Thanks for being with us tonight. Uh, thanks, Brian. Thanks, Rhonda. Coming up next, this week's winners and losers in the media, as chosen by the editors of Mediaite. You're watching Brian Ross Investigates on the Law and Crime Trial Network. Time now for this week's winners and losers in the media, as chosen by the editors of Mediaite. And we're joined by Aidan McLaughlin, who's the editor-in-chief of Mediaite, which, like the Law and Crime Trial Network, is part of the Dan Abrams Media Empire. And Aidan, we begin with Dana Bash at CNN. You've chosen her as your winner. 
technology, of right. course it has downsides, but it also has right. very powerful positive effects. But, and, but my question and it's one is specifically about January 6th. Did the algorithms that are in place amplify pro-insurrection voices ahead of January 6th? Yes or no? So quite the interview. Why was she chosen as the winner, Aiden? Right. So that was Dana Bash on State of the Union on Sunday interviewing Nick Clegg, a top executive at Facebook who has acted as a, uh, one of the top spokespeople for the platform. Um, the interview has come in the wake of disclosures from Frances Hagen, a project manager at Facebook who has now turned into a whistleblower. Uh, she testified before Congress last week and called for Facebook to be regulated. Uh, one of the revelations from Hagen, uh, the whistleblower, is that Facebook helped fuel the January 6th riot at the U.S. Capitol. Um, Bash asked Nick Clegg about that on CNN Sunday, and he failed to provide a clear answer for whether or not Facebook had a role uh, in fueling these sort of this misinformation uh, and the organization that led to uh, that riot. He basically said that Facebook has no answer as to whether Facebook played a role in the attack. Um, Dana Bash pressed Nick Clegg multiple times in the question, uh, and it made the interview, I'd say, one of the highlights uh, of the Sunday shows. Holding his feet to the fire. And for the loser this week, Sharon Waxman, tell me about her. Right. So the Daily Beast came out with a new report over the weekend about Sharon Waxman, uh, who is the founder and CEO of The Wrap, uh, which is an entertainment and media website that uh, was launched in 2009. Um, the report found that uh, Sharon Waxman runs a toxic environment, uh, which has created a culture of fear uh, that's demoralizing and degrading to staffers. Um, so for those who don't know, The Wrap uh, is a media and entertainment website uh, launched by Waxman, who's a veteran journalist. Uh, and she launched it to take on the, the big Hollywood trade outlets like Variety, Deadline, The Hollywood Reporter. Um, but this report from The Daily Beast found pretty shocking antidotes. Uh, one was that she screamed uh, at a staffer who took his wife uh, to the oncologist um, for a cancer treatment checkup. Um, there's a number of other pretty shocking uh, allegations in the report. Um, one of the uh, a deputy editor, um, Tom Greer at The Wrap, uh, issued a comment to the Daily Beast, where he accused uh, some of the sources that spoke to the Daily Beast um, of working for Jay Penske, uh, who is a rival media mogul to Sharon Waxman. Um, so there's a little bit of a of media conspiracy theory in this as well, um, Brian, but I think there's enough sources on the record um, that you can say that this is a pretty solid report. All right, Aidan McLaughlin, thank you so much for being with us here tonight. And thanks to all of you for joining us. We'll be back again next week. And thanks to our great team here at Law and Crime for getting us on the air and off the air.